please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Hello and welcome to Commodity Champions, your weekly dose of what's brewing in the commodity space. I am Manisha Gupta. Let's begin with the wrap of all the action from the week gone by. And it was the industrial metals which gained on the back of a fall in the US dollar as concerns over the inflation trend drove investors to move the money into hard assets. It was an impressive week for zinc, nickel and copper with zinc hitting its highest level in 2007, nickel at its highest in three years as well. The copper prices are headed for the biggest weekly gain since the month of November. Aluminum, though, didn't have a very great week, with prices sliding as stocks of the metal saw the biggest weekly gain since May of 2009. In the other metals week to date, zinc prices are trading up 5.5%, lead is up 2%, while gold and silver prices as well gain nearly 3% for the week. Let's talk more about the gold prices then and they are trading to the nearest in the highest level since August 2016, up 3% and in a month low that we saw it touch in the previous week. Another precious metal in focus is palladium which is also set to see its best week since the month of October last year. On the crude oil front, prices are trading at a one-week highs on the back of weak US dollar. The dollar index itself is down 3% in 2018 till time. Although OPEC has said it is committed to cutting supplies, U.S. output has been on the rise and hence the prices have been under some pressure. Remember, the crude oil prices have gained 50% in the second half of last year and in 2018 now, of course, we have seen some pressure come in. Joining us to talk more about the outlook of crude, gold and metals is Edward Morse. He's Global Head of Commodities Research at Citigroup. Ed, hi, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. What is your sense on the crude oil prices? We did see $70 per barrel, but the prices did not sustain there. What is your sense on where are we looking at and what do you, where do you see the prices headed from here? Yeah, so uh, we have been of the position that the uh, move of Brent above $70 was always going to be temporary. It was not really sustained by fundamentals. It was a function partly of tightening fundamentals uh, in the Northern Hemisphere's winter, given the exceptionally cold weather in both China and in North America, which had boosted up demand for all forms of fuel, whether it's coal or natural gas uh, or oil, particularly on the diesel heating oil side. Uh, but what we saw in the months of December and January, the latter part of December and the beginning of January, was a kind of euphoria uh, in the capital markets with a lot of uh, inflows coming uh, into all asset classes, but particularly into commodities. And the reasons for it were uh, two or threefold. Uh, first of all, there was uh, a de sharp decline in the U.S. dollar, and uh, a lot of traders had the view that the sharp decline in uh, the U.S. dollar meant that commodities would be on the rise. Uh, we know from recent history uh, that that is really a temporary factor in the market, and we estimate that not more than 20 percent of the move up was a function of the U.S. dollar's decline. All right, Ed, that's an interesting take, of course, on the dollar movement and its impact on the crude oil prices. So uh, what would you say? Have we seen the 2018 highs for crude or is there a chance of a spike in the prices by, let's say, third quarter as we go ahead? Yes, well, I'd say that uh, while I give a good 60 percent probability to this lower case uh, that we are proposing, we think there is a good possibility that there will be something that will lead to a price spike over the course of the year. So if we look at five particular members of OPEC, starting with Venezuela, but then looking in Africa at Libya and Nigeria, and then looking into the Middle East at Iran and Iraq, these five fragile countries, the fragile five members of OPEC, could all of them see uh, a supply disruption over the course of the year? When it comes to Venezuela, we're already, already seeing uh, production falling. Uh, year on year, the, that fall on a rolling 12-month average is about 400,000 barrels a day. Uh, that is likely to keep up. It may even accelerate. 
Uh, and we think that Libya and Nigeria, having returned from uh, lower levels of, uh, of production to a higher level, we think this higher level may not be sustainable. So the chance of a disruption in Nigeria and Libya together with Venezuela at the same time uh, is very, very high. All right. Uh, that's about the crude oil prices and lots of fundamentals to watch out for. But, Ed, this is a week where we've seen 3% gains come in for gold prices. Also, last week, same time, we were trading around 1300 We are trading around 1360 right now. Where do you see the prices headed? Well, we see the gold price um, actually uh, more likely to go up a bit rather than go down. Uh, and, uh, and the reasons for that is that gold is a particularly strong uh, hedge against wild cards in uh, the commodity markets, particularly uh, in the oil market. And as we look around the planet, there's plenty of political risk, whether it's focused on uh, the People's Republic of Korea or uh, areas in the uh, South China Sea uh, or the Middle East, and in including uh, where we, uh, we, we looked uh, just a few minutes ago at oil in Nigeria. Uh, and in Libya. Uh, we also uh, note that uh, uh, gold responds to rate increases, uh, and that's because there are inflationary expectations uh, in the world. I think everybody looks at what the uh, Federal Reserve Bank, among central banks, is doing, and uh, gold has become uh, very sensitive to that barometer. So we would not be surprised to see uh, gold uh, inching up uh, higher over the course of the year uh, in response to those activities and uh, flows into gold should continue uh, strongly as a result of the uh, uh, wild card opportunity that would come should there be uh, some kind of political issue arising uh, in the world. Silver is a relatively different issue. It responds more than uh, gold does to uh, uh, the jewelry market, uh, we think that uh, there may be some uh, room for uh, an upward price correction in silver, getting it back uh, in the upper teens in terms of U.S. dollars, maybe even hitting uh, 20 at times. Uh, so, you know, that's it for, uh, for those two particularly precious metals. So even as you are bullish for both the metals, the precious metals, that is, what is your sense on the range part of it? Would you say that we perhaps have done the bottom for gold prices right now? And if yes, how much higher are we looking at the prices from here on? So we, we, we think gold is going to be in a 13 to 14.50 range uh, going up and coming off, but maybe ratcheting up a bit to a higher price level. Uh, and we think of silver in a, uh, in a $17 to $19 range. Uh, again, uh, we're at the lower end of that at the moment, and we think it could uh, inch up over the course of the year. Mm. Ed, done crude and gold prices, but the best performance of this week clearly comes in from the industrial metals, where we have seen them headed for one of the best weekly gains in months and years, actually, with most of these metals trading at a multi-year highs. Where do you see these prices moving in? Do you see more strength coming in? And would you have a favorite when it comes to the metals as a sector? Uh, we, we are looking at the metals uh, category as an area for, uh, for in enhanced uh, investment uh, and investment opportunities, both on the equity side and on the underlying commodity side. Uh, China lies uh, significantly at the heart of this, of course, uh, and even with the uh, changes in, uh, in the uh, prospects for Chinese GDP growth, uh, the metals demand in China is likely to uh, stretch the limits of production capacity, both within China and globally. And within China, we note uh, there has been this uh, strong policy uh, unfolding under Xi to uh, shut in uh, uh, production that is expensive, uh, that uh, is uh, uh, super abundant. Uh, we've had uh, production of aluminum uh, shut in, of copper uh, shut in, uh, and that means a, a bigger pull on the global market. Our favorite uh, metals for the year are nickel and zinc. Uh, zinc because uh, the supply-demand balance is reaching a point on the cost curve where there has been limited investment. 
uh, where we can see new investment on the horizon. So we think we need a bit more of a boost on zinc. Uh, to get that incremental supply into the market. Sure, but you know, Ed, even as you say that nickel, nickel and zinc are your favorites, while zinc has doubled in last 24 months, how would you look at the nickel prices going forward, though? And what also is your sense on copper, other minor metals, etc.? I mean, barring, of course, aluminum, because that, I assume, would be an exception as supplies are on a rise on that one. On nickel, uh, what we're seeing, again, is... Uh, supply demand balance is going up, particularly in the case of nickel, like cobalt and lithium. Uh, it is very sensitive to uh, electric batteries. China is in the lead on uh, building electric vehicles, on uh, electric battery technology, and this uh, should uh, boost all of those uh, metals that are particularly uh, uh, at the core of, uh, of the EV phenomenon that's unfolding. Uh, finally, uh, copper, we see a demand growing uh, in China, uh, partly uh, through the vehicle side, partly through the construction and building side. Less so this year than we had previously thought uh, would be the case on uh, building out the grid uh, or building out power plants. So we see power construction and grid construction uh, declining a bit or growing at a lower rate in 2018 than 2019. So, we're, you know, we're favorable to copper uh, going up a couple of hundred dollars a ton, uh, but not the kind of thousand dollar uh, boost that we see uh, on the nickel side. And finally, uh, in aluminum, uh, as you mentioned, uh, stocks, uh, whether LME stocks or Sheffy stocks in China are going up. We've seen a high level of, uh, of inventory, and we think uh, that will be adequate to satisfy demand growth. All right, Ed, we'll let you go at that. Really appreciate you coming by and taking your time out and giving us your opinion on all of those commodities and currencies as well. So that's the view coming in from City. Consolidation in case of crude oil prices, buying for precious metals and industrial metals, and their favorite picks, of course, are nickel and zinc going forward. Well, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi is meeting experts, economists, and academicians and policymakers on the 19th and 20th of this month to discuss ways of solving several problems plaguing the agriculture sector. That's not all. The meeting will also discuss methods in which farmers' income can be doubled by 2022. And on the 20th, the PM will listen into presentation from all the seven subcommittees and come out with a seven-point agenda. In light of the recent rains and hailstorms which battered crops in the parts of UP, MP, Maharashtra, this meeting has taken on more importance. Plus a discussion on the much-talked-about hike in MSP, which was announced by the finance minister in his budget speech, is also expected to take place at this meeting. Now, what should the government focus on in order to alleviate the farmers' pain? To discuss this, we are now joined by Ravindra Agarwal, MD and promoter of Kisan Craft. But before we start our discussion, let's listen into the Agriculture Secretary, Shobhna Patnaik, speaking to CNBC TV 18's Ashpreet Sethi about the upcoming meet. We have divided the conference into seven broad themes. Mm. And within those themes, we also have the sub-themes. For example, sustainable development of agriculture, if you have to say that now, we have to concentrate and focus on how we need to uh, um, really ensure that uh, farmer produce enough and not only they produce enough they get the right uh, price for what they produce and um, how to ensure that uh, agricultural credit really um, reaches to the uh, small and marginal farmers but the underlying theme will be whether it will help in doubling of farmers income uh, so that the primary aim is to ensure that ultimately farmer takes the benefit of all this to increase his income unless his in income increases there will be no sustained interest to the farmer to continue in agriculture finance minister has said that um, uh, government will be um, uh, declaring msp but if the market prices are below msp then there should be a mechanism to compensate the farmers right. so that they get at least the value which the government has promised. Mm -hmm. Now, the mechanism of uh, giving this difference to the farmers has to be thrashed out in consultation with the states for which Niti Aayog will take a meeting of the stakeholders. It is in this connection that a meeting is separately been carved out. Mm -hmm. we, are, we have sought the dates from the Niti Aayog and once they give it, which perhaps will be taking place in the next 10 or 15 days. 
All right, that's the agree Sikhi, of course, laying out the plans of what is expected in this meeting. Joining us then is Ravindra Agarwal, MD and promoter at Kisan Craft. Ravindra, hi, good to have you. What is your sense? Because the agrarian crisis is something that we have seen continue for a second straight year. This one, the conditions have been quite, uh, you know, weak, bleak, if I may say so. What is the expectation that the industry now has from this meeting? Do you expect a policy formulation actually coming out of this? Yes, I do. Uh, government has been definitely sincere about uh, trying to figure out mechanism to solve farmer distress. It has been certainly slow, but the government has been making efforts. And I do hope that they look at all the aspects. Uh, in my opinion, they have to look at uh, how to reduce the cost of input. They have to look at uh, agriculture infrastructure. They have to look at farmer education, something which gets uh, ignored uh, many, many times. And then we have to look at uh, the income of the farmer. Uh, I certainly hope that they don't limit themselves to uh, just fixing MSP. Uh, the big issue today is that what is farmers' retained income compared to the retail value of the produce? Why is a farmer getting 5 rupees a kg for tomato when you and I are buying tomato for 40 rupees a kg? Hmm. And that is something they have to figure out. And without inflationary pressure, they can, uh, they have to try to increase the farmer's income. Oh, well, absolutely. The supply chain and the value addition chain efficiency is something that the markets have been asking for the longest time. But Ravindra, the ease of doing agribusiness is yet again on top agenda. And the value addition is something that the PM and the FFF 